Okay, it's already time, right? Yeah, it's time. Okay, guys, let's uh, let's get started. Wilson, <laughs> put away your Ruby cube. Okay, uh, so we'll get started today. So um, remind, remember, we're talking about this uh, Michaelis Menten model of enzyme reactions. So S is the substrate. In other words, the thing that you're trying to change, the, the, the food that you try to transport or the whatever it is you want to modify, uh, E0 is the enzyme in unbound form. E1 is the bound enzyme meaning the enzyme bound to a substrate. So it's really a complex of two molecules. And P is the product. OK. So that's the, fi the, the final product, the final transported food or modified molecule or whatever. So we, we wrote down this model, and we derived a two-dimensional system from it. Two-dimensional ODE. The um, the ODE was the SDT equals minus K1 E tot, and I'll, I'll remind you in a moment what E tot means. K minus one plus K1 S. E1 and D E1 DT equals K1 E tot S um, minus K minus 1 plus K2 plus K1 S times E1. OK, so these are the equations. E tot and S tot are what again? Uh, Natalie? Um, so E tot is the enzyme that is bound to enzymes. Sorry? Is E tot the bound enzymes? The total enzyme bound, only bound? No, that's E1. E1 is the enzyme oh, bound to the so substrate. Like all of the enzymes? That's right. Whether it's bound to the substrate or it's not bound, you add them all up and it gives you E tot. So that would be E0 plus E1 is the total enzyme. And Natalie, what did we say about this value, the total enzyme? Does it change much over time? It doesn't change, right? It's a parameter of the system, if you will. You start with certain value of this thing, it stays throughout. What about S dot? Um, Daniel? What was that again? S dot? S dot is the total abdomen. Total substrate, that's right. It's the total amount of substrate, whether it is in modified form or unmodified form. So we'll, we'll add them up, right? So modified form, let's start with unmodified form, that's S, right? Modified form, that's P. And are we missing anything? E1, the That's right. We call that E1. It's the complex that's made up of substrate and enzyme. So we need to add it up. This is the total substrate. OK, so these things are constant over time. They don't change over time, they're constants. So we're, the way, what we did last time was we replaced, you know, instead of writing E0 in the system, we wrote it as E tot minus um, E1. And that way, we get, essentially get rid of one of the variables. 
E0 never shows up anymore because we have replaced it in terms of a parameter and a variable. So we get rid of one of the variables. And the other variable, which is P, we just ignored. Because you see, <coughs> none of the other variables' concentrations depends on P. So we can just analyze this system by itself. And then in the end, if you want to know how P changes, we'll use that equation. But for the analysis of the system, otherwise, we don't need it. OK. So we reached this two-dimensional system. Today, we're going to analyze this thoroughly. And we're going to derive, uh, basically, I'm going to show you how the system behaves over time. But we're going to make an, an, another assumption that is very important. Basically, the whole thing uh, would not work if it wasn't for this, which is that E tot is much less than S tot. So what does that mean? Remember, we're transporting food uh, using a receptor, for example, or we're tagging a molecule using uh, some smaller catal cat catalyst. So the concentration of the catalyst is much smaller than the concentration of, of the substrate, right? For example, if you're talking about a catalyst in a, rea in a chemical reaction, catalysts sometimes are like very expensive materials like uh, gold or platinum or things like that. In the case of the example we talked about, it's the receptor that's sitting on the membrane. There's not a lot of it. There's very little receptor compared with how much food there is, right? So the concentration of this guy is much more than the concentration of this guy. How that's, how that's going to be important, you'll see in a moment. But just uh, keep in mind that there's a lot less enzyme that there is, that there is substrate, OK? <clears throat> OK, now we are ready to analyze this thing. So what we're going to do is to non-dimensionalize the system so that we can reduce it to something more manageable. Non-dimensionalize. OK, and we're going to use the usual <coughs> the usual parameters. So t is the old variable. We're going to write it as new variable times a parameter. OK, so this is a new variable, time variable. This is a parameter. Uh, we're going to use our s is going to be equal to uh, a constant, let's say s hat, times the new variable, little s. and uh, E is equal to, sorry, E1 is equal to E hat times little variable E. So these are the new variables, and these are the old variables. All right, now we're going to write down our differential equations in terms of the new variables. We've done this before. We replace big S with um, S hat times S. We replace the T with um, T times tau. And we can bring this outside. So this is S hat divided by T multiplied by D little s D tau. OK? And this is equal to minus K1. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write, instead of E tot, let's just write E sub t. Because there's going to be a lot of E tots showing up. Let's just write E sub t um, uh, times s. And then s is s hat times little s plus k minus 1 plus k1 s hat little s times e hat little e. Okay. Um, similarly, we can write this down as um, d e hat e d t tau is equal to e hat divided by t d e d tau. And this is equal to, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to replace s by the new variable, e by the new variable. Uh, so this is k1 
e tot, which I'm writing as et, s hat s minus k minus 1 plus k2 um, plus k1 s hat s times e hat e. And I'm writing e tot or et is equal to e tot. This is shorthand. Okay, so today we're going to basically do this non-dimensionalization argument, which is a little bit there's a, there's a bit, quite a bit of notation as you can see. It gets it can get a little bit messy, but it's it's not a problem. It's it's uh, not too much. So. We're going to multiply on both sides of the, this thing to get start cleaning this up, okay? <clears throat> so let's start cleaning up. Um, so let's multiply on both sides. You see there's an S hat in here, there's an S hat in here. So, I'm sorry, there's an S hat in here. So I would like to actually divide on both sides by S hat. So let's do that, but we need to be a little bit careful. the little s d tau is equal to, okay, and I'm also going to multiply by, by t. Okay, so let's do these two things. Divide by s hat, multiply by t. So I multiply by t on this side and I get minus k1 <coughs> e t t s, okay, because I got rid of the s hat, plus, Okay, now notice that there is no s hat in here, but there is an s hat here. So I'm gonna divide each of these two terms by s hat. This is k minus one, s hat plus k one, s, and then here I'm going to write e hat t, Yes, you agree, Wilson? Good, awesome. So now D, E, D, tau. Oh, actually, you know what? Um, I'm going to multiply this guy by T, but I'm actually not gonna try and get rid of the hat. I'm gonna leave the hat there. And instead, I'm gonna bring this S hat down here. Okay, it's, it's a trick, okay? So multiply by T on both sides and divide by S hat so that the thing on the right is gonna look similar to what's here. So this is now um, e hat divided by s hat d e d tau is equal to k1 e t t s okay, because I brought this s hat down and I multiplied by t minus um, K minus one plus K two divided by S hat plus K one S E hat T E. Okay, so I did something similar on this side. I basically I divided on both sides by S hat and I multiplied by T. You guys agree? Great. <clears throat> okay, now what? Well, now we want to, we have these clusters of, of parameters. For example, we have these three parameters in here, and we have these three parameters in here. And we're gonna start to try and choose the values of t, e hat, and s hat to simplify this a little bit. So, um, let's see, um, Patrick, if you wanted to simplify this by Assigning values to the new to the parameters. What would you choose? Uh, let t equal negative one over k one e t. Yes, very good. So set set t equals to uh, one over k one 
e tot. Okay? So if you do that, then this whole thing becomes equal to 1, right? Right? OK. Great. And uh, for example, let's see. Uh, OK, so now we also have to replace t in here by that thing over there, right? OK, so there's going to be a 1 over k1 uh, and then an et. Uh, so this, the, basically, this guy is going to cancel out with the et, and there's going to be a 1 over k1 on this side. Uh, what about s hat and um, what else? S hat and e hat. What do you think? Hmm? Well, let's just make it easy. Let's define s hat to be our parameter s dot, or actually. AKA ST, so that we simplify it a little bit. And uh, let's set E hat, E hat equal to E tot. Okay, so now we can actually make more sense of this, this term over here. <coughs> This term over on that side becomes now, so this is now the SD tau. And on the bottom, we have E tot over S tot multiplied by D D tau. Now, remember about what we said about E tot divided by S tot? We said something about E tot with respect to S tot. What was that again? E tot is much smaller than S tot. So this, this, this thing over here is what? It's very small, right? OK, great. Keep that in mind. Because remember, we talked about, we th last time we talked about time decomposition, right? But fast variables and slow variables. So this thing is multiplied by a very tiny number. See? That's the epsilon. That's right. Great. OK. All right, so now this guy over there becomes equal to uh, this is 1 over this, so this is minus 1 times s, okay, plus, I'm going to replace this t by 1 over k1 uh, et, so there's going to be an, this guy's going to disappear, okay, and I'm going to have a 1 over k1, and I'm going to bring this k1 inside, so I get uh, k minus 1, k minus 1 divided by k1 st. And this k1 cancels out with the other k1, and we get an s. Uh, and this is e. OK. Does this make sense? Is that, was that too fast? So think about e, e hat. Now it's e tot, right? And you replace t by that. So you end up with a 1 over k1. Right? You multiply out the k1 inside here, and you get a k1 down here, and this k1 disappears. So you get this. OK, now what about that second equation? This thing, again, is equal to 1 for the same argument as before. So this is just s. Okay, And um, when we replace t by that, uh, basically something similar happens, the same thing as before. And so this is k minus 1 plus k2 divided by k1 s dot plus s, the whole thing multiplied by just e. OK, so that's what the system looks like now. Do you guys have a question about how we got here? We just replaced those values in here, we wrote them in here. OK, so next, we have those new clusters of, of, of parameters. You know, we have this cluster here, we have this cluster here, and we have this cluster here. We're going to give them names, new names. OK, 
It's the same thing we've done always for non-dimensionalization, right? New names to parameter clusters. So, um, Krista, what do you think we should call E tot over S tot? Absolutely. Great, thanks. Good. Um, the other ones, we, I mean, there's really no, no, no reason to call them one way or another, but I want to call that guy k minus 1. divided by uh, k1 is t. I'm going to call that guy lambda. No, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, lambda. And um, I'm going to call k minus 1 plus k2 divided by k1 is t. I'm going to call that one k. OK, so using that notation, uh, the system is is just the SD tau equals minus s plus lambda plus s e and then epsilon times d e d tau is equal to s minus k plus s multiplied by e. And we've seen it before, right? You saw, we saw it in the, la, in, in the end of the last class when we talked about time scale decomposition. I, just, I want to point something out. Um, notice there's one of these parameters is bigger than the other. What do you think? Lambda or k? Um, Mr. Suarez, what do you think? Which one is bigger? Uh, K. K is bigger, right? K is strictly bigger than lambda because all of these things are non-zero, right? I mean, these are, none of these parameters can be equal to zero. So because K2 is strictly bigger than zero, K is strictly bigger than lambda, OK? Also, I want to point out that is a slightly different notation um, notation from the book. In the book, there's a slightly different use of k and lambda. Okay. All right, but we're just going to be just going to write it the way that we did now. Um, so now we're going to analyze this uh, this system, and I'm just going to do it again. Um, even though we did it in, in, in the last few minutes of the last lecture. Yes, Wilson. Um, when, when you do like a second follow, how you got to the D2 equations, mm -hmm. but if I was given a fresh equation, I wouldn't. If, if you were? If I was given like a fresh, like just the. If you were the, given these equations from the start? No, like the, um, whatever we started with, building it. Mm -hmm. And then before the dimensionalization, is there a certain reason that we chose to do? Because I don't think I would have saw to divide by S. Like this, right? So, so some of these things are actually tricks. For example, there's also not it's not clear how how we came here, right? right? This was kind of out of my out of my sleeve. So yes, I mean you know certain certain times, especially for these systems that are like famous mathematical models, there's basically tricks that people have used, and it's not you know clear necessarily why, right? Um, I think there can be other ways to do it that would reach the same kind of conclusion. So don't worry too much about the exact details about how you got there. Just find some way to get there. And then if somebody else did it in a totally different way, they'll reach the same conclusion. So you know, by the cosmic elegance of the mathematics, you know, it should, it should all work out. <laughs> I know it's not very satisfying, but, but it, it does work out. I mean, the conclusion that we're going to reach applies to the original system. I'm not, I'm not going to just say something about this simplified system. I'm going to conclude something about the original system. So if you do it in a different way, you should be able to reach the same conclusion. OK? That's a, that's, a good, that's a good question, Wilson. Thanks. OK, so all right. 
So since epsilon is small, we do time scale decomposition, which is why we spent the last lecture talking about it. And I'm actually quite happy that we did, because um, it's, uh, it's, it's going to come in very handy now. So which one is the slow variable, and which one is the fast variable? Um, and Daniel? So we have this system, right, with a very small parameter. It has two variables, s and e, OK? And this very small parameter is multiplying the derivative of e. So if you want to make more sense of this, you can divide on both sides by epsilon. And you get d e d tau equals a very, very big number, OK? So if the derivative of e is very, very big, that means that e is the, which one? <laughs> the derivative of a variable is very big. That means the variable is moving quickly, right? Fast. Yes. Are you sure? Yes. OK, and s is the slow variable. OK, so now we're going to start our analysis by doing the fast time scale. From the point of view of the fast variable, the hare, the, the, the rabbit, OK? Um, so which one is the rabbit again? The rabbit is E. So let's look at the rabbit and see how it behaves. And the assumption we're going to make is that what? What, what do we assume in the fast variable case, the fast time scale? S is constant, that's right. Because S is so slow, let's assume that it's constant and let's see what happens with E, OK? So assume that S is constant. And we have the system d e d tau. And we could, we could multiply by epsilon, but you know, because we're looking at it from the point of view of the rabbit, you know, it's like the world slows down because everything's so, so you're so fast, right? So let's ignore epsilon. Otherwise, making the whole um, the diagrams is going to be very hard because we have, we're multiplying everything by a tiny number. So uh, we, we can ignore the epsilon. And this is basically s minus k plus s multiplied by e. Now this system is actually a linear system. Remember that s is now a constant, right? So we have a one-dimensional system, E and E prime, and there's a straight line going down. So this system is stable. It converges towards a single steady state. What steady state is that? Well, we can get that from the, by, by finding the, the root of the system. That is, you said 0 equal to, uh, what is this? So that means that E is equal to S divided by K plus S. All right, so what this means is that we have this line here, which is the line S over K plus S. And the first thing that happens to the system, the fast dynamics, is that it approaches, you know, S doesn't even have time to change. E approaches very fast this curve right here. OK? That's the first thing that happens. This is a fast time scale. All right. So I want you guys to, 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 to realize that after a fast, let's say, transition time, Um, e is approximately equal to S divided by K plus S. Because you see, the first thing that happens, say that the initial condition was here. First thing that happens is the rabbit converges very fast to wherever it's supposed to go. Chan, like this. OK? Then we're going to have a slow dynamics take place. And let me tell you now, now what the slow dynamics is. But the first thing that happens is this convergence towards this, this curve right here. 
All right, so let's look now at the slow dynamics. Slow time scale. What do we assume in the slow time scale again, uh, Brian, number two? Sorry? Uh, okay. That the converges? Exactly. So E converges instantaneously. Okay, towards or to S divided by K plus S. Okay. So now we can write the equation ds e tau equals um, that thing over there. Okay, but remember, this is equal to lambda plus s multiplied by. Um, S over k plus s, and I remember last time we I I I, well, I didn't quite know how to handle with this this thing, but now it's actually not not hard. So let me try again. This thing can be uh, can be simplified quite a bit. You you factor out s and you write this as um, lambda plus s divided by k plus s minus one. So it's minus one over there, and I can write this as s times, and I'm going to write everything in a single, in a single um, a fraction, which is on the bottom is k plus s, and on the top is lambda plus s minus, and then I'm going to bring this into this fraction in here. So I have to multiply up and down by k plus s, and so this is minus k minus s. Make sense? Now this is equal to s times lambda minus k divided by k plus s. And this is the same thing as lambda minus k multiplied by the number s divided by k plus s. Okay, but what happens with lambda minus k? What sign does this have? It's negative because? Because we said k is bigger than lambda. So there you go. This system is going down to zero. You see, uh, this function, like this function here, is um, has this shape. So if now I write s and s prime, okay, this function looks like this. It's negative, so the solution converges to zero. That's what happens with s at the slow time scale. Okay, so there you go. Now let me let me try to put all together and tell you what happens with the system. This is S and this is E. Here we have the curve S over K plus S. And let me take a typical solution. Typical solution, let's say we start here. First thing that happens is that very quickly the system goes straight up towards this, towards this line. And then very slowly it starts following, it starts, S starts going down. That's what happens. We're following the slow dynamics where S starts going down. But remember, every time that S changes, E quickly adapts and converges towards the new steady state. Fast dynamics, remember? Whenever S changes, whenever the, whenever the turtle moves, the rabbit quickly converges towards its new steady state. So the, uh, the system is always satisfying, it's always on this, on, this, on this line. Like this. Does that make sense? Yep. That's it. If we started, for example, over here, the first thing that happens is converges towards this point, 
and then it starts moving slowly down this line. Okay? But notice that most of the time, most of the time you look at the system, this, the, uh, the system is going to be on this curve. You see? Because it's going to be following the slow dynamics. The fast dynamics is the first thing that happens is this. And then very slowly follows this line down to zero. Okay? Do you guys have any questions about the dynamics of this system? Or is it more or less clear? OK, great. So now that we've analyzed the system and we're happy with it, we're going to go back to the original system. Remember, this was the simplified little s, little e. Okay. So now we're going to bring the situation back to the original system. back to the original system. If you remember, if you remember, um, we wrote E1 is E hat times little e, and we wrote S is equal to S hat times little s. And actually, I think it's the first time we do this. We haven't done this like going back to the original system before. OK? So <clears throat> So recall after a fast transition time. E is roughly equal to S over K plus S. Okay, so all that I'm saying here is that after a, you, you wait for a moment, you start running the system, you wait for a moment, and then suddenly the system is on this line right here, right? So this straight, this line right here is the line E equals S over K plus S. So after fast transition time, the system always satisfies this equation. Now, what does this equation mean in terms of the original variables? Well, e, little e, is equal to e1 divided by e hat. So this is e1 divided by e hat is roughly equal to little s is s hat, I'm sorry, big s divided by s hat. Um, and uh, what was the value of k again? Okay. What was it again? K minus one. Okay. Oh yeah, you're right. You're right. Actually, actually, I'm sorry. We, we I should really say is. Uh, yeah, because uh, at some point we we, we defined the s hat and st as, as um, an e hat to be actually the total protein concentration. So this is this is e dot s dot s dot plus um, big S over s dot. Okay. And now I can multiply by s dot all over, and I get s divided by k minus 1 plus k2 divided by k1 plus big S. So that means that. So I'm going to multiply on both sides by e tot, and I get e is equal to e tot multiplied by s divided by km plus s, where km 
is the variable, I'm just defining this as a new variable, is k minus 1 plus k2 divided by k1. And this relation between e, I'm sorry, this is e1, yeah, e1, this relation between e1 and s holds after, after a fast transition time. You know, you run, start running the system, and then after a moment, this relation starts holding. And it continues to hold throughout. Great. Sorry. Okay, so then, um, so now, why are we doing all this? We're almost done, but we, but I, I haven't, I haven't quite told you we're done with what. You know, we, we basically want to analyze the system. Well, actually, you know what? Let's, let's just draw the. <clears throat> let's just draw the new system. The new system is S E one. This line right here is the line E dot S over Km plus S. This is the original two-dimensional system. Okay. And after rescaling, we have the exact same behavior as before. You start the system, let's say, over here, start to run it, and the first thing that happens is you have convergence towards that, this, this line right here. And then you start having the system slowly go down like this. So actually, this Wilson, this resolves your question. No matter what precisely what tricks we used, we are now concluding the behavior. We're now describing the behavior of the original 2D system. You see, this is now independent of the, the particular trick we used. If we had used a different trick, we would have gotten a different, uh, let's say, simplified system. But the original system looks the same as before. Okay. All right. So that's how it looks like. Okay. First of all, so that's, this, is, this is the behavior of the michaelis menten original system, the 2D system. Second conclusion is we can actually solve an important question we had, which is what we started with uh, last time, and is the following question. Ultimately, the system is going to converge towards zero. But that's not all that surprising. You see, you have a certain amount of food, you have a certain amount of receptors, and you have a cell, you know, and you're transporting the food. The whole system consists of transporting the food from the outside to the inside. So it makes sense that in the end, all the food has been uh, consumed, right? If you just wait for the long run and look at the steady state system, all the food has been consumed and con converted into a product. So that's not terribly surprising. You know, the, the fact that in the end there's no S left is not particularly surprising. What we want to find out is how fast, what is, how fast is the food getting consumed? And that is something that we can find out from this, from this graph right here. Let me write this down. So it is not surprising that substrate is depleted in the long run. But this analysis allows to describe how fast it is depleted. Okay. And here's the, here's the punchline. If you recall the differential equation for P, who can remind me of the differential equation for P? The one that we didn't even bother to write for. Krista? K2 times E1. Okay? So the rate of production of the food, 
of the, of the, the rate of importation of the food is a constant times E1. But we took all this trouble to show that this equation is satisfied after a short transition time. So we can plug it in there. So dp dt is roughly equal to k2 e tot s over km plus s. That is how fast the food is getting, pro is getting processed. You know, you wait for a little moment, you know, for a moment there's like a, like a mess, you know, there's some stuff jumps around, and then after a while, this equation is satisfied, and you can find out how quickly the product is appearing, the, the food is get, getting transported. This is, this is the original michaelis menten equation. So this equation describes the flux of, um, of food or, or the rate of modification or however you want to call it depending on the context and it has a nice property that it is as a function of s independently of e0 and e1. You see e0 and e1 don't show up anywhere in here. And that's nice because you see e0 and e1 are in such small quantity you could never measure them or at least not back in when they were doing these experiments. So this is a very nice formula because it tells you depending on how much food there is available to change or to transport, it tells you how fast the flux is happening. Okay? There's uh, one more thing. Um, uh, notice that there's, there's an e-tot in here. So what is the flux per enzyme What is the flux per enzyme molecule? So there's suppose that there's 10 enzymes. So this is the total flux. But there's 10 enzymes. So if you wanted to calculate the flow per enzyme, you have to divide this thing by E tot. Right? So the flux per enzyme molecule is K2 multiplied by S constant plus S. And I think that this is a relatively straightforward equation. You see, if there's very little, so it's like basically you, you have this enzyme, like make your, put yourselves in the point of view of the enzyme, okay? So you're an enzyme, and the, your job is to transport food. When there's a lot of food out there to transport, you, it makes your life easier, right? You can transport it you know, better when there's a lot of food than when there's no food. If there's no food out there, the, the, the flux is zero. You see, this function is zero. But, if there's a ton of food, if there's like a millions and millions of items to transport, you are overworked. At some point you can only, you have your hands full, you can only work so fast. So the, rate, the, the flux becomes saturated, you see? Uh, in other words, the, the, the more food there is, the, more, the faster you work, but at some point you cannot work any faster. What is the fastest rate of work per enzyme? K2. It's K2, that's right. And what is the fastest flow overall? It's K2 times E tot. Great, that's it. That's the that's the Michael Smith model.